So we'll get started. Thanks, Very thank good. Uh, welcome everybody, uh, Los Angeles Mission College community, faculty, staff, students, administrators, and community members. Uh, we are having an historic occasion today, in my mind, uh, given all that's going on and all of the different things we've been addressing as a college community and a community at large with the pandemic, the economic downturn, uh, transition to online education, uh, and also the whole arena of uh, racial equity and social justice, the social unrest that has been occurring. Uh, it's time for us to really be introspective, look at how we're doing and where we're going. Uh, I, want, I have the pleasure of joining Dr. Frank Harris today, who's gonna facilitate this session. And again, I wanna thank the faculty, uh, the Academic Senate and others that helped design this important uh, event. Uh, I want to say that, um, uh, give a little background and I know that uh, Vice President Larry will introduce Mr. Dr. Harris uh, shortly, but uh, by way of who we are, we were founded in 1975 as the newest college of the nine Los Angeles Community College District, one of the nine. Uh, we have about 10,000 students we serve annually uh, that are enrolled from uh, diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. And we, of course, provide very strong transfer basic skills, adult ed, transitional and career education program. We are an HSI, Dr. Harris, uh, an MSI, Minority Serving Institution. And over three fourths of our students are Hispanic, one of the highest percentages in California and in the United States. 62% of our students are female and two traditional college age, uh, 25 years old and younger. Um, our primary service area is Northeast San Fernando. So if you've ever been in our area, you, you'll know what that is. Uh, Northeast uh, has Pacoima, San Fernando, uh, and, and a variety of other cities. We have a satellite center in Sunland, Tahunga as well. And we're really uh, uh, being sought after by call, uh, call the Kenyans and other areas, um, Canyon country and other areas. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, our service area medium, a lower medium household, high poverty rate and low educational attainment. 55% uh, of our uh, credit students receive financial aid, 56% are working while attending school, and 13% work full time, 40 hours a week or more. And uh, we try to accommodate all the needs of families three quarters of our credit students attend part-time. So over 75% of our students attend part-time and 34% attend evening classes. That just gives you a little uh, thumbnail sketch of who we are. Uh, like other community colleges, we're serving the working poor. We're serving first generation. We're serving individuals that, that want to move forward for a baccalaureate and on and beyond, as well as workforce education. So. Having said all that, again, I want to welcome you and thank you, Dr. Harris, for joining us today. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Resendez. Larry, if you could introduce our, our guest facilitator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited uh, that this day has come. And before I properly uh, introduce Dr. Harris, let me just say uh, how much I appreciate some of my colleagues for spearheading this effort. I want to start with the Associate Student Organization, our Professional Development Committee, our Guided Pathways Steering Committee, our Student Equity Access and Success Committee, our Library and our Academic Senate. And of course, you know, we always have the unwavering support from Dr. Perez. And, and as Dr. Harris mentioned, you need that support from the top. And we always have that in Dr. Perez. So we very much appreciate you, sir. So Dr. Frank Harris III is a professor of post-secondary education and co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab at San Diego State University. He's best known for his expertise in racial equity and post-secondary education and has made important contributions to knowledge about college student development and the social construction of gender and race in college contexts. 
His work prioritizes populations that have been historically underrepresented and underserved in education. Dr. Harris's scholarship has been published in leading journals for higher education and student affairs research and practice, including the Journal of College Student Development, Journal of Diversity in Higher Education, Educational Researcher, International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, Journal of Negro Education, and the Community College Journal of Research and Practice. Dr. Harris also regularly disseminates scholarship through refereed conference proceedings, workshops, symposia, and keynote addresses. He has delivered more than 500 academic and professional presentations throughout his career. Dr. Harris is the co-editor author of four books, College Men and Masculinities, Theory, Research, and Implications for Practice, Teaching Men of Color in the Community College, Teaching Young Boys and Men of Color, and Supporting Men of Color in the Community College. His commentary has been sought by several high profile media outlets, including Diverse Issues in Higher Education, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The Huffington Post, Inside Higher Ed, CNN, and Fox 5 News San Diego. Before joining the faculty at San Diego State, Dr. Harris worked as a student affairs educator and college administrator in the areas of student affairs administration, student crisis support and advocacy, new student orientation programs, multicultural student affairs, academic advising and enrollment services. He also served as an adjunct professor of speech communication at Los Angeles Trade Tech College. Dr. Harris earned a bachelor's degree in communication studies at Loyola Marymount University, a master's degree in speech communication at Cal State University Northridge, and a doctorate in higher education from the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. A lot of accolades there, Dr. Harris. Without further ado, I wanna turn it over to you and thank you so much for being here. We feel blessed and fortunate to have you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Resendez, for the warm introduction. I uh, also wanna thank colleagues on the Academic Senate, Guided Pathways, uh, the, the Associated Students, I believe, had a, played an important role in this effort. Um, and, and, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this, this important conversation for LA Mission College. I, you know, I, and um, you know, hearing Dr. Perez and, and sort of open us up and share that uh, the college was, was founded the same year that I was born kind of kind of gave me chills <laughs> and, and let me know that I'm, uh, I'm in the right place and at the right time. And um, I also want to acknowledge uh, another important point here. So Dr. Perez shared what I, I think was a, a beautiful profile of the campus. You know, being an HSI, being an MSI, you know, serving a, a critical mass of adult learners and, you know, three quarters of students who are attending part time. And, um, you know, as, as the LACCD Chancellor uh, Francisco Rodriguez always says, you know, what a tremendous opportunity we have to serve uh, a beautiful re and resilient group of families and students. Um, and so, so I feel that and I, um, I, I welcome the opportunity to be, play a small role in that today. Um, if we have any students who are joining us, if you could just give us a thumbs up and let us know that you're here. I hope we, hope we have at least some students. I know this is uh, often a challenging time to, to engage students, but if we have any here, um, I wanna thank you for being a part of this, let you know that your voice is important and your experiences and, and what you have to bring not only enrich the, well, enrich the conversation we have today, but it makes LA Mission College the college that it is. And so, uh, you know, we thank you for, for, for your presence. We thank you for your leadership and we thank you for everything that you do to, to enrich, uh, enrich our lives as educators, um, you know, in many respects, I'll, I'll sort of say. And then of course, um, I wanna give a big shout out to Bamdat uh, Sami who, who worked behind the scenes with regard to all the, the technical things and, and making sure we had a, a seamless setup today. And so uh, that's a perfect segue to me I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and begin to prepare the remarks that um, that the group has asked me to, to speak to today. And uh, looks like we're good there. And then what I'm going to do is just kind of spend spend some time sharing the remarks that I prepared. Um, and we should have ample time to engage in some Q&A and for have folks share their thoughts and reflections to, to some of the things that I have to that I have to share. But, um, you know, of course, the focus of our time today is, is really engaging the question, you know, how do we, we transform our institutions, right? Not just LA Mission College, but even, you know, San Diego State, you know, my home institution and, and some others that, that um, you know, we know sort of serve as, as sister campuses. 
you know, how do we transform them given everything that is occurring today with the pandemic, you know, the fight for racial justice, uh, the fight against anti-blackness, um, everything that's sort of happening today, you know, how do we create these beacons of racial equity and, and racial justice, right? How do we make sure that, that um, you know, those, those um, you know, that, that racial justice and racial equity is, is, is alive and well and thriving on our campuses, especially given the, the populations of students and families and communities that we serve. Um, as Dr. Resendi has mentioned, I'm Frank Harris III. I have the pleasure of being a professor at San Diego State. But one line that was, was um, not shared that I think is important to acknowledge is that early in my career as an academic, uh, I started as an adjunct professor of speech communication at LA Trade Tech College, which is you know, obviously a part of the district. Um, and I taught speech communication from, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Thursdays. Uh, so I got to, to, to work with some incredible students. Um, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't as, as well informed then as I am now about, about equity. And you know, um, I think about those students often and think about how I could have done a better job of, of serving them and teaching them. But I reflect a lot about that experience and it, it really has helped to shape my thoughts. It's really helped to shape, uh, you know, who I am as a scholar and researcher today. And so I'm deeply appreciative of that experience. In, in terms of what I hope to accomplish during our brief time together today, um, it's, it's, it's really fairly simple. We're going to talk about some, you know, what are some institutional barriers that get in the way with regard to closing equity gaps? And, you know, I would even say uh, achieving institutional transformation for equity and with a particular focus on racial equity. Um, and, and, and we're gonna kind of talk about those two things um, fairly intensely. To tell you a little bit about uh, my work, I co-direct the Community College Lab. Uh, it's a lab that I developed almost a decade ago with my friend, my brother, and my colleague, Dr. J. Luke Wood, who some of you, uh, you know, may have had the opportunity to meet. Um, and essentially what we decided at that time um, is that the, most of the research and most of the national conversations around equity and around student success, that they weren't acknowledging the important role that community colleges play. So for example, we know if we're, if we're talking about any disproportionately impacted population, right? If we're talking about adult learners, students with disabilities, former foster youth, justice impacted students, um, you know, racially minoritized students, uh, the overwhelming majority of students who fit that profile are enrolled at a community college, a place like LA Mission College. And those who are not enrolled there, um, let's say they're those who, who are at universities, many of them begin their, their educational journeys at a community college. And so it was important for us at the time to, to really elevate the voice and, and elevate the prominence of the community college uh, in this national conversation quite frankly, we got tired of going to conferences and going to all these meetings and people saying that they were serious about, you know, post-secondary access and post-secondary success and not talking about the, the magic that happens at a community college. And so we wanted to, to address that. Um, so we created SEAL. What SEAL allows us to do is to partner intentionally with community colleges to institutionalize equity. We have three ways that we go about doing that. Uh, first and foremost, through assessment and inquiry. So developing surveys and developing inventories and just kind of coming up with tools that helps our colleagues at community colleges assess the status of equity at the institution. Uh, and, you know, given our role as professors, uh, we are, are very much engaged in, in collecting and disseminating empirical research. So a lot of what I'll have to share today is informed by our own empirical research. And then we're very much involved in providing, you know, what I like to describe as high quality and high impact professional learning experiences. So having conversations like this, uh, where we're, we're able to really kind of share the things that we're learning from a research perspective and talk about what are the implications for practice? What are the implications for student success? One thing that we try to do is to make sure that everything that we have to share is accessible. So, you know, we, we don't, um, you, we don't get sort of caught up in, in, in our roles and identities as researchers, but we're very much focused on translating research to practice. And I hope you'll, you'll find that to be um, sort of the tone and flavor of what I have to share today. To get started with regard to the content, I, I think it's important that we start by making sure we have a shared concept of what equity is, because we're gonna talk a lot about equity today. And more specifically, we're gonna talk a lot about racial equity um, as well. 
And we know that at its core, equity is ultimately about enacting intentional strategies to address disparities that impact students who experience disproportionate impact. In other words, students who are not benefiting from their participation in post-secondary education as much as other students are, right? And we know from our work, and I sh I'm sure most of you, uh, nearly everyone who's involved in this conversation has seen this, that there are certain groups of students that consistently experience disproportionate impact on almost every indicator of student success. This is a snapshot of who some of those students are. This is by no means an exhaustive list. And we know that there's a lot of intersectionality you know, that's represented here. So of course, a student can be a racially minoritized student who also happen to be a former foster youth who might also have a disability and so forth. Um, and taking this conversation further, um, I, I really want to call on and acknowledge uh, a, a mentor, a colleague, and someone who's really guided my thinking, and, and I would say shaped my identity as an educator, and that's Dr. Estella Bensimone, who some of you may know. And Dr. Bensimone is largely credited with giving us the concept of equity-mindedness. She gave it to us more than two decades ago. And she talks about equity mindedness as first and foremost, being race conscious. So understanding how race mastered and understood in our efforts um, to understand systemic oppression, um, disproportionate impact, everything that we do as relates to equity uh, has ele an element of race that's, a type, that's, that's uh, involved in that. I'm gonna talk about that, I believe in the next slide actually. Uh, we also have to view equity in student outcomes as a matter of institutional responsibility and accountability. So it's not about asking what's wrong with students and what are students doing wrong. Really, it's about asking what's wrong with us as an institution and who we are as educators and how we do our work that's allowing inequity to exist and persist, right? That's, that, that's a real key paradigm shift in many, you know, for, many, for a lot of people. Uh, third is we have to enact intentional efforts to affirm our, you know, racially minoritized students, to affirm their identities, to, um, you know, to see their, their racialized identities not as deficits, to not see them as liabilities, to not see them as things that get to the way. But as an educator, to see these aspects of their identities as assets that can be leveraged to influence their success. Really important. Uh, of course, we have to be consistent and critically reflecting upon who we are as educators and how do our efforts either help to close equity gaps or allow inequity to persist. And then finally, uh, we have to see student success as a reflection of who we are and as a reflection of our effectiveness as educators. We have to be personally invested in students and in student success which I know is very different from when we think about the ways in which most of us were socialized as educators to think about students and to think about student success. We, um, we have to really challenge this paradigm, uh, this traditional paradigm of what student success is and what it looks like. And then of course, um, especially in today's context, we cannot divorce equity mindedness from race consciousness. We have to acknowledge that being racially conscious is at the core of being equity minded. And this is not to say that other forms of oppression and discrimination are not important and should not be acknowledged. Of course, uh, they absolutely should be. But what it does remind us is that we cannot substitute race or overlook race for other aspects of identity in our efforts to achieve educational equity. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, how equity mindedness is connected to our efforts to address the concerns of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as many of you know, the pandemic has had a disproportionate effect on communities of color. And therefore our efforts to serve students in this context, this context of COVID-19, um, you know, it, it requires us to be racially conscious, but it also requires us to pay close attention to what we call digital equity. And digital equity is not just giving a kid a laptop or not just giving a student, pardon me, a laptop and access to Wi-Fi and saying, okay, go on your way. 
But digital equity is also about making sure that students have the knowledge and the information that they need to seamlessly access these virtual spaces and even further to be able to make meaningful contributions within those spaces. So, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, requires more of us of educators, of equity-minded educators, uh, if we're really gonna truly stay committed to um, our goals of achieving institutional equity and racial justice and racial equity for that matter. And so, you know, of course it's easy to define equity and it's one thing for me to say, okay, this is what equity is and this is what it looks like. But I think it's also important to understand why, uh, you know, what, what are some of the reasons why most equity efforts are not successful? And what I have offered here is a short list of issues and challenges that have consistently come up in our work with colleges, um, you know, at the Community College Equity Assessment Lab. And what I would like to do is highlight a few of these. One of the most significant factors is the one that's represented third on this list, and that is deficit perspective. And deficit perspectives are what we call self-fulfilling prophecies in our work. If we believe a student doesn't belong or a student is not capable, then it will have an impact on the ways in which we teach that student, the ways in which we serve that student, and it's gonna be reflected in the vibe and the energy and our motivation to go the extra mile to support that student. And I'm gonna get a little personal here and be transparent and think about my experience as I share with you um, as an adjunct faculty member at, at LA Trade Tech College almost 20 years ago. And if I'm being honest, I can say that the students who did well in my classes during that time were the students that I believed would do well. And conversely, the students who struggled were usually students who I did not necessarily believe in or went out of my way to support when they encountered difficulty. And so this is why we need to be incredibly intentional and mindful about our implicit biases and implicit assumptions and the, 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 the assumptions that we make about students based on you know, how they show up in many respects. A second reason I'd like to highlight is when we have a poor conceptualization of what equity means and how to practice it. Equity is about closing disparities in resources, information, and opportunity. And what this also means is that we cannot give every student the same thing. That would be the definition of equality. Equity is about giving students what they need to be successful. It's about eliminating institutional barriers and getting out of their way. And then finally, I'd like to spend a little bit of time discussing this last point that we see represented here on the slide, toxic resistance and toxic support. And in doing so, um, I wanna share a taxonomy that my colleague Luke Wood and I uh, developed a few years ago to kind of to kind of just to make sense of the range of perspectives that we were encountering on a regular basis as it relates to equity. We were doing a lot of work at the time, traveling all over the country, um, and we got to hear and have a lot of candid conversations with colleagues about equity and why it works and why it doesn't work and why it's important and why it's not important. And we thought it was important to, to sort of uh, come up with some framework to make sense of what we were um, observing. And this taxonomy has, has played a real key role in, in our thinking and in our institutional transformation work with colleges. And so what you see here is, is this taxonomy has two constructs. Let's, the first we describe as competence, and this is represented at the top of the framework with the labels know what to do and don't know what to do. And we can think about competence or knowing what to do simply as an educator's knowledge and understanding of equity and equity-minded practices. So I know what equity is. I know what equity-mindedness is. I know how to practice it. I know how to infuse it into my work as um, a, a counselor or a STEM professor or a financial aid advisor or whatever it may be, right? I know what it is and I'm doing it, right? That, that, that was where competence would be. But we also know this that knowing what to do is not enough. Because I don't know if anyone is like me that has middle school children, right? They know what to do in many respects, but they don't always do it, right? 
because there's this other piece that's important, that's motivation. And we see this represented uh, at the left of the figure labeled willingness to employ practices and unwillingness to employ practices. So let's start with the, the box that's labeled KW is at the top right of your screen. And we can say that this captures the perspectives of educators who know what equity mindedness is and who practice it on a regular basis. And we like to call this group the choir. And we call them the choir because more often than not, it's the choir that's leading equity efforts and conversations on most of our campuses. And that's important, right? The, the choir plays a very important role in our equity efforts and in our equity work. But far too often, we see where the conversations are with the choir are only occurring with other members of the choir. And so we have these other stakeholders and we have these other perspectives and we have these other constituents that we have to engage if we're ever gonna reach our ultimate goal, which is institutional transformation. And so let's talk about the allies, right? The group we see here at the top left. What separates the choir from the allies is that the choir, excuse me, the allies, they haven't had the coaching, the professional development and the opportunity to really learn about equity mindedness and to learn how do you infuse it into your practice with students, right? How do you use it to guide your work with students? However, if you give the allies an opportunity to learn and, and, and develop equity mindedness, um, they could easily be a part of the choir. And now it would be easy if we could just, you know, if, if that's all we had to deal with, right? If we could stop there, but we can't because we have other groups that we have to engage, starting with the one at the bottom left, which we call the resistors. Now the resistors haven't embraced equity mindedness. They don't see it as necessary. And quite frankly, they're not motivated to do so. And we find in our work that there are two types of resistors, active resistors and passive resistors. Now active resistors are just the ones who are the most vocal and forthcoming in their opposition about equity and equity efforts. They're the ones that are asking, why are we doing this, right? Why are we worried about X group? They're such a small part of our population, right? This is not about us. This is about their families. It's about their communities. There's nothing that we can do. These students aren't prepared. This is reverse racism and so forth, right? But here's what's interesting. Um, the active resistors usually represent a larger, excuse me, a smaller, contingent than we, than we assume and realize. Because they tend to be most vocal, we tend to think that they, they, they sort of represent a larger contingent than they actually do. However, most resistors are actually passive resistors. So they're not gonna necessarily be as vocal and transparent about the opposition for equity, but they're also going to avoid any and every opportunity that they have to authentically engage in it. So they're not gonna show up for a voluntary conversation such as this one, for example, right? They just won't show up. Um, and then you have the defiant. And these are the folks who have been trained, who have a good understanding of equity and equity mindedness. They know what it is, they know how to practice it, but they refuse to do it with the students who need the support the most. Now they might do it with the students who, who, who live in their neighborhood. They might do it with the students who work in their, their lab. They might do it with you know, one of their work study students, but they're not necessarily willing to, 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 to take an equity-minded approach to serving students who really need this support. Now, after presenting this framework one time, Luke and I, uh, you know, we happened to be at a conference. And as we were leaving the stage, uh, we had a colleague that, that, that tracked us down and said, hey, Frank, Luke, you know, I, I like the framework. It makes sense, but it's missing something. He said, what about the folks who think they're equity minded, who think they're a part of the choir, but they really have no idea what they're doing? And so Luke and I reflected on that. Uh, and we, we, we came up with another group and recognized that we needed to add them to the taxonomy. And we call this group the oblivious. And we call this group the oblivious because one can become oblivious in one of three ways. It's um, the first way is when we, we, we approach our equity work from what we call a savior complex. When we believe that our work is about saving students rather than empowering students. 
And I think we can honestly say that students, they don't need us to save them, right? They have what it takes to be successful. They need us to eliminate the stuff that gets in the way and get out of their way. But when we do that, and I know we, we can all probably think of many examples of students who, who, who um, you know, took off like a rocket once they got into a good mindset, they got the support they needed, they got the resources they needed, we eliminated some barriers. And that's, that's what really students need, right? When, when, when we're not looking at our students or we can't approach our equity work from a deficit perspective. Um, Second is when we're not reflective in our work. And this occurs when our words and the values that we espouse are not aligned with our actions and the ways in which we teach and serve students. And then the last one is what we call grandstanding. Now grandstanding happens when our commitment to equity it's more about developing a reputation for being equity-minded, advancing our careers, or being perceived a certain way by our colleagues than it is about the work and about serving students and about making the institution a better place, right? And so we have to be mindful about this. We can never really be comfortable with where we're at and who we are. If we get to a point where you're like, okay, you know, I got this equity thing down. That should, that should be a wake up. That, that should be a red flag. That should be, that should signal an opportunity to do some deeper reflection, to build our, to do some more intentional work to build our capacity. Because this is not easy work. And many of us were not trained in our graduate studies. I, I can obviously, you know, speaking personally, to do, uh, to do this work, it's not second nature, right? It takes a lot of deep and intentional effort on our part. And so also what we have to do and what this taxonomy helps us to do is to understand that we have to be targeted in our and intentional in our messaging when it comes to equity. We can't have the same message and the same approach with every person. So we say that we have to be, uh, we have to empower the choir. So again, the choir already understands it, knows it's important, they're already doing it, but what they need to know is that what they're doing is making a difference. Keep doing it, give them the resources, give them the space, give them the platform to continue to do the work. And with our allies, we have to educate the allies. We have to give them opportunity to be exposed to concepts, to be exposed to research, to be exposed to practices that are aligned with equity and equity mindedness. Now with the passive resistors and the defiant, we have to encourage them. Because the problem with, with both of these groups is that they don't care. They don't see themselves um, and they don't see the value of equity and how it's good for students and how it's good for the institution. And then with the oblivious, uh, you know, we have to have critical but collegial conversations with the oblivious, right? We have to have conversations with them that says, you know, Frank, I like you, I like what you do. I think what you do is important. I think you bring a good perspective, but you know, when you're in a search committee meeting and you say that uh, you know, we shouldn't expect to get any, any qualified candidates of color because you know, when there, there, there aren't that many in the, in the pipeline of our field, well, that, that really sets us back. That doesn't help advance us um, and help us achieve our equity goals, right? And that's what we have to do. And given all of this, and given everything that we know about equity, and I'm sure some of what I had to share, some of you are probably nodding your head in agreement because you've seen it, you've experienced it, you've heard it, and so forth. And so we know a lot, but there's one painful truth that we have to acknowledge, is that most equity-related initiatives are not successful in transforming an institution. And um, the reason why is actually fairly obvious and fairly simple in some respects. The reason is that most campuses um, are not successful in institutionalizing equity because we focus too much on strategy and we haven't done the intentional work that's necessary to ready and shape our institutional cultures. 
So I want to spend some time talking about this because I think it's a real important point as, you know, for any institution or for any group that's saying, okay, we need to design something. We need to be more intentional in how we, we engage issues of equity and how we address racial equity. We got to make sure we're, we're, we're approaching it the right way, excuse me, the right way. And what I want to offer is uh, that I, something that I hope is instructive and insightful that informs the work of the groups uh, and these key stakeholders as we move forward. So let's, let's spend a little bit of time talking about this. As you all can see, probably tell at this point, I like taxonomies. They, they, they help me kind of make sense of things. They help me, um, you know, make sense of what I'm seeing and put it in a framework that, that allows it to be easy to talk about as well. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share another one with you. Um, and this taxonomy helps us understand the, the interaction and interplay between institutional culture and strategy because far too often we get those things confused. Right, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So culture. Culture is reflected in the institutional elements we see presented here. And by and large, our equity efforts, right, do not address these key elements and factors that have a profound influence on the culture of an institution and ultimately our success in institutionalizing equity, right? These are the, these are the things that they, we sort of think about this as the heart and soul of the institution. Um, and then we have strategy, and this is what we focus on, right? Do we have equity-related policies and practices? You know, do we have equity plans? Do we have guided pathways? And are we using multiple measures to assess students as they come in? I know assessment is, is very different now than it used to be, but those who've been around, you know, as long as I have, you know, that assessment, you know, used to work very differently than, than it does now, right? Well, are we using multiple measures? And do we have professional development, right? And are we doing all these things that we see presented here? And we assume that by enacting these strategies that our institutions are going to transform and become these, these, these beacons of equity is what we assume. But let's, let's, let's think about this and let's go back to the issue of institutional culture. We have found that you can have an institutional culture that is what we describe as equity enriched or equity deprived. And let's talk about what that looks like. So let me give you some examples here. So to give a quick shot of the difference between an equity enriched and an equity deprived culture, Here's some examples of the things that I have, have observed in my work with campuses. On the left uh, are examples of what an equity enriched culture looks like. And on the right is what an equity deprived culture looks like. So for example, let's look at number three. When we see equity as an indication of institutional responsibility, as opposed to being seen as something that's, that's exclusively an indicator of student performance, the nest, this would be indicative of, you know, potentially indicative of an equity and rich culture. Of course, um, you know, it's not about checking off the list here and doing, you know, these five things that we see here and the things we'll see on the next slide, right? It's not just about that, but these are all indi indicators, potential indicators of an equity and rich or equity deprived culture. Let's look at number six. We are potentially equity enriched when we have campus leadership that is both transparent and unapologetic about the need and intention to prioritize equity as opposed to being fearful or ashamed about it. I know some folks are, are probably wondering, well, who's fearful and ashamed about equity and about prioritizing equity? Well, I'll say this, you know, things, the, the way we see them now, are, are, they haven't always been that way, right? There was a time where, you know, uh, you know being transparent about equity and kind of having equity be a core part of what the academic senate does or what the executive leadership does or what the district leadership does, that that wasn't always well received and it didn't get you very far, you know, in terms of resources and support, right? Um, but that, that's yet another indication. Now, let's look at how this taxonomy works when it comes to strategy. So just like we can have an equity enriched culture and an equity deprived culture, we could have good strategy and we could have bad strategy as it relates to equity. 
Now, I, I kind of struggled with this part of the taxonomy a little bit because I was like, okay, is it, it, it should we say good strategy here or should we say no strategy? And I sort of, you know, I was like, oh, is it better to have good strategy? Excuse me, is it better to have bad strategy or no strategy? And I think I ultimately landed on the decision that I think bad strategy is worse than no strategy. And, I, you know, I'm not completely sold on that. I mean, I, that, that's sort of how I'm feeling about it. Uh, but, of course, I can be convinced otherwise. But let's, let's go with what we have here. Good strategy, uh, a bad strategy, okay? So here's some examples, right? Good strategy, bad strategy. Let's look at number three. Historically, right, and number three says, in, in the example there is, you know, when we have intrusive and equity-minded professional development that occurs throughout the year, and that's accessible to all campus personnel, and when possible, it's required of everyone, okay? As opposed to, you know, professional development that's passive, that, you know, doesn't build capacity, is only available to certain people, and it's strictly voluntary. That's not a, that's a bad strategy when it comes to, to institutionalizing equity. Now, historically, institutions have only, you know, only used to prioritize full-time faculty and managers in professional learning efforts. When I first started doing this work and when I first started working with campuses, you know, about a decade ago, um, it was mostly full-time faculty and, you know, your, your managers that would attend sessions. Now that, that has changed quite a bit. We see a lot more intentionality in, in making sure that the entire campus is exposed to, you know, high quality and high impact professional learning. We have adjunct faculty that are part of it, which I think makes, I, I think that's absolutely essential because we know, we think about the classes, particularly those entry level classes or those gatekeeper classes, I like to call them, that is, it's primarily adjunct and part-time faculty who are teaching those classes. Um, we talk about our classified professionals, right? Think about the folks who are working in the, the welcome center or who are working in outreach or who are working at, uh, at the front desk in financial aid or you know, helping students make their counseling appointments, right? Those are the folks that are you know, encountering students on a regular basis. They're encountering students at incredibly uh, critical times in, in students' matriculation. And so, yeah, of course, we have to build the capacity of our professional, uh, our classified professionals in this as well. Um, also thinking about students, right? So our students who are working as tutors, our students who are working as instructional assistants, our students who are working as academic coaches, right? They have an important role to play here as well. So they need professional learning and professional development if we want equity to be institutionalized. They play a key role in this. Uh, yesterday, for example, I did a half day training for a campus police department at a community college that was focused on equity. Completely blew my mind, right? When, when this, this college reached out to me and said, hey, we wanna be more intentional in making sure our campus police are a part of this conversation. Cause you know, obviously they, they play a key role in this as well, right? We need to make sure everybody, but anyway, uh, you know, not to digress too far. Um, I also want to highlight a second set of things we see here. Let's look at number eight. When we provide intentional spaces for folks to engage in difficult but necessary dialogue about race, racism, and racial equity, right? That's, that's a good strategy. Uh, on many campuses, this conversation is often muted, it's unwelcome, and it's completely disconnected to any conversation about equity. And so, you know, we're gonna, we got, we're actually gonna talk about this uh, in a few minutes, but that's another example of, of how strategy becomes important. So um, that being said, returning back to our taxonomy, we know we can have an equity and rich culture and good strategy. That's what we see represented here at the top right. And of course, this is the most desirable place to be as a campus. Uh, moving to the left of the taxonomy. Um, we could have an equity deprived culture, excuse me, uh, we could have uh, also have equity deprived culture and good strategy. And we'll talk about what the implications of that are in the next slide. At the bottom left, we could have an equity deprived culture with bad strategy. And obviously no one, no one wants to be there. All right, and we could have, you know, an equity and rich culture with bad strategy as well. And so what are the implications of, of, of each of these? So when we apply good strategies in an equity and rich culture, 
they were likely going to be very successful and effective in institutionalizing equity. Right? I've seen it. This is this is you know this this is good in, in many respects. Although we can't be completely comfortable here. And in the next slide, I'm gonna explain why that may be. But 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 stay with me for a minute. Uh, what happens when we apply good strategy in an equity deprived culture? Well, all of our efforts are going to be external. They're going to be on the margins of the institution. They're never going to penetrate the institutional core, right? They'll never get to the point where they, they, they have a profound and measurable influence on the institution's identity and what the institution does, right? It'll always be something that happens over there, right? And I've seen this over the years where I'll go and visit a campus. I say, okay, well, you know, show me what are you doing around equity, student equity, right? What are you doing? And it's okay, well, let me take you over here to EOP. Or let me take you over to Puente. Everything that we're doing around equity is happening here. And I'm like, okay, everything? Like, this is where all the equity happens? So it's not happening anywhere else? No, 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 it's all happening here. We're going to show you, and you're, you're going to like what you see, right? And that's what happens when we have good strategy, even if it's the right strategies, but we have an equity-deprived culture. Um, and, and in that sense, everything's externalized, right? But what about when we have bad strategy in an equity and rich culture, which is what we see at the bottom right? Then what happens is when it comes to institutionalizing equity, we, we, we might have some success in some regard, right? We, we might close some equity gaps. We might create some safe and inclusive and welcoming spaces for students. But we're not going to understand why or how that occurred, and we're not going to be able to replicate it. It's just, you know, it, it just kind of happened. And then what happens when we have an equity deprived culture and we're applying bad strategy? Well, then, you know, that institution is going to be completely inept when it comes to, to institutionalizing equity. And to further complicate matters, check this out. I have found that some campuses are great when it comes to institutionalizing equity for certain groups of students and completely inept when it comes to other groups of students. And so again, we have to be very intentional and we have to pay very close attention to the progress or the lack thereof of our efforts when it comes to institutionalizing equity. And so I'm sure someone is asking, okay, Dr. Harris, that all sounds well and good. This is great. Well, tell us what we need to do then, right? How do we do it? And um, what I have to offer are some, you know, I, I, I think some, some first steps, perhaps, right? Um, but I think the first thing we have to do is to engage in what I call a transparent and non-judgmental assessment of the institution's disposition towards equity, right? Where are we equity enriched? Where are we equity deprived? Right, and I'm, I'm presenting this taxonomy as an institutional taxonomy, but you will also think about how it applies to certain divisions or certain departments, right? Maybe we're really good, you know, in the sciences, but we're really struggling in, and you know, the humanities, or we're really good in athletics, but you know, we're really struggling in counseling, right? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different layers to this, right? It can be really complex. But the idea is to figure out, you know, where, where do we have allies? Where do we have resistance, right? Where, where, where do folks tend to be oblivious when it comes to, to equity? And then we can start to think about strategies. And it's not just applying any strategy. It's not just applying what Trey Tech does or what LA Valley does. It's about figuring out what are the right strategies for where we are as a college, right? Given our culture, given the things that are working in our favor as it relates to institutionalizing equity and the things in the places where, where we have resist, resistance and challenges. So it's not just applying anything, it's applying the right strategies where we can get some, some early wins, start to build some momentum, start to get some critical mass in key areas and build up on that is, is what we want to do. And then um, we also have to do this. And I'm saying and then as if, as, if, as if this is sort of a sequential thing, but you know, some of these are things that we can be doing simultaneously, right? So it's not intended to be this rigid 
sequential framework that 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 it may appear to be. But um, you know, the next thing we want to think about is how do we develop a transparent vision of the campus culture with equity at, at the core, right? The, the message here is this is where we are as a college. And this is where we should be. This is where we need to be. And this is what it's going to take to get there, right? We have to start to really create a vision for what it is and what it looks like. That's, that, that, that vision is important. And aligned with that vision is we have to engage in what we call strategic messaging. So this is where your strategic planning, you know, really comes into play and your equity planning kind of comes into play. But the message has to be, we can achieve equity, right? We can eliminate equity gaps at our institution. We can be a place that's safe and welcoming to our minoritized students, right? Whether they identify as black, or Latinx or Southeast Asian or part of the indigenous population. Like we can be that, we can actually achieve it. And we have to do it because it's aligned with our values. It's aligned with who we say we are as an institution and what we say we value as an institution. So we have to do it and we have to do it urgently because our students and the community that we serve right, the East San Fernando Valley is counting on us to do this because we're their institution. And if we don't do it, then who will? And more importantly, when we do this, it's going to make us a better institution. We're going to be a better LA Mission College as a result of these efforts, right? That, that messaging has to be consistent. Uh, you know, it has to be conveyed at convocation and, you know, any events with donors, uh, you know, welcoming students, it has to be become a core part of what people hear on a regular basis as to what we, what our vision is and, and what are we trying to achieve as an institution. Uh, also, sort of thinking about this symbolically, uh, we have to embed tangible indicators of equity throughout the institution. And, uh, you know, we have to, it has to be reflected in our, our buildings and in certain designated spaces the pictures on our website and our, and our branding as an institution, in our mission statement, in our value statement, right? So people have to see it, they have to hear it, they have to feel it on a regular basis. Like you want, right, we, we want this to be a place where you, if you work here, if you're an educator at our college, or if you're a student, you can't like, like equity is gonna be everywhere you go and turn. Like you can't get away from it because ultimately it's about having it be a core part of our culture and a core part of our identity as an institution, right? That's, that's what we're trying to do. And we have to create what's called a shared accountability for commitment to equity, right? So that means that, you know, if I'm, if I'm an educator at LA Mission College and I say something or I do something that's not aligned with who we are, or what we want to be or where we want to go, then I should, I should be held accountable for that, right? Um, equity should be a part of how I'm evaluated as an educator. It should be a part of my, my, my performance evaluation. How am I helping to contribute and advance, uh, you know, the institution's equity goals? And I know that there's some implications there for collective bargaining and, you know, there's, there's, there's union implications for that. So obviously, you know, this all has to be done in, in concert and in consultation and in collaboration with, you know, the leadership of those stakeholder groups and so forth. Um, we have to think about how do we create this in, in our hiring practices, right? How do we assess equity in our hiring practices? And this last one here, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this one. And then uh, once I discuss this one, we'll have some time to engage in some q and I would love to you know, get some thoughts and reactions to, to what folks have heard, um, and any questions that may be brewing. But given where we are right now as a country and given the racial climate of our country and the fight for racial justice in our country, every campus has to really address and take a hard look at itself and address campus racism with a sense of urgency and with transparency, right? Uh, and how do, we, how do we do that, okay? What's, and there's some, some things that we can do as a part of that, right? First is, is acknowledging that, you know, 
a lot of what we're seeing with regard to racism and you know, uh, you know, issues pertaining to racial equity, um, that they didn't just start with the murders of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and Tony McDade and Sean Reed and, and, and far too many others in name, right? And, um, and I know we see the, the, the national movement has been focused on you know, black lives, but you know, we know that there are, you know, our Latinx communities have been uh, targeted and have, have suffered atrocities. Our indigenous communities as well. Um, there's been, you know, our Asian American communities have been targeted, particularly at the, the, the outset of COVID-19 and, you know, and the, the racist rhetoric that, 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 that has been directed towards them. And so, um, you know, this is, this is a real issue, right? And what we see here, what I, what I offer is just a snapshot of kind of, you know, some, some important events and movements that got us here as a country. And so we need to acknowledge that. And, and, and part of it is thinking about, um, you know, if we're an institution and we're authentically committed to addressing uh, racism and we want to have a, we have to have a trans, what I call a transparent reconciliation of the ways in which racism and white supremacy sits at the core of our institution history and our legacy, right? So we need to think about, so for example, you know, how were the bodies of, you know, minoritized people and communities, um, how were they used as labor and how were they used as capital to build and find, you know, a, 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 as the foundation of the institution, right? Now we don't see this as much with our, our community colleges, right? But when we think about, you know, some of our institutions are, you know, 200 years old, some are older, and we know that, you know, many institutions were founded and, and, and funded by the sale of, of, of slaves, all right? There, there has to be some acknowledgement of that. There has to be some reconciliation of that. Every institution has a history and a legacy, right? We have to revisit that and address it and be forthcoming about you know how we got here as an institution and atone for those things. Um, some institutions might find it to convene a task force. I say a task force and not a committee because a task force should you know should have a, a start date and an end date, right? It shouldn't necessarily be something that, that goes on forever, but maybe in some cases a committee might be helpful. But I would think about who are the stakeholders that need to be a part of this? Uh, you know, who are the faculty, staff, students, community stakeholders, community members. Uh, you know, it, it's helpful to have somebody who's, who's familiar with the history of the community in which the college is situated. So somebody who understands the history of the San Fernando Valley and how, um, you know, what was going on at, in 1975 around the, the early origins of the institution that, that may have helped to advance uh, racism and help to see, help us to see the legacy of that today. And whatever you do, I would say it's very important to share the findings of this effort. I see a lot of colleges, they do this and they, they don't like what they find and they decide to bury it instead of you know, share it and have a, a public conversation about it. And I, I think that's a mistake and a missed opportunity. Um, and then also thinking about things like um, you know, campus rituals and artifacts and statues and buildings and you know are, are there other symbols of racism and the history and legacy of racism at the college that need to be addressed and, and atoned for and then thinking about how do you find tangible and concrete ways to atone for it right we've seen a lot of colleges release statements of solidarity you know for black lives and we stand for black lives but there's no concrete steps they don't talk at all about you know what they're going to do as an institution to sort of address it um, concretely and transparently. And so some things you might think about are, you know, scholarship funds, perhaps, uh, you know, naming campus programs after prominent uh, alumni, people of color who are, who are graduates of the college, um, you know, tuition waivers, whatever it may be, right, that, 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 that can all be a part of the conversation. Uh, we also have to lift minoritized voices, right? And the examples you see here are, are black, but I, I think it goes you know, beyond that. But we have to talk with, with students, we have to talk with employees, give folks the opportunity to tell their stories. Uh, because telling your story can be both instructive and healing for those who've been targeted and disadvantaged by racism. Now this has to be done systematically, it has to be done rigorously, 
um, the questions that should guide this inquiry, uh, you know, should focus on the ways in which the institution can be more responsive and effective in eliminating racism, right? It's important to believe what they say. It's important to acknowledge intersectionality as a part of this. So don't just, you know, grab your student leaders, right, because they're convenient, but thinking about, you know, adult learners, you know, students who are attending part-time and students who, who may be student athletes and all these other important identities that intersect and create a unique lived experience for students. Um, next, we need to think about, you know, how do we address it in the campus culture? How do we address racism in the campus culture? Um, you know, thinking about curriculum, for example. I know one thing that we're doing at San Diego State that, that our president, Adela De Torre, who's, who's um, you know, a, a, a wonderful president, who was calling for a comprehensive review of the, the entire campus's curriculum and wants us to be intentional in embedding and addressing, uh, you know, designing our curriculum in a way that will allow us to address racism. And, and perhaps more importantly, that's going to prepare our graduates to be able to, to go and change the world and address racism in a tangible way. So for example, I'm a faculty member in the College of Education. So the question for us is how do we make sure our graduates, those who are gonna go on and, and leave the college and go on to be teachers and to be counselors and to be you know, faculty members at community colleges and community college presidents, how do we make sure that they have what they need to disrupt racism at the institutions and in the places where they're gonna be teaching and serving students? Uh, we think about student services, for example. Um, you know, we know that our students often experience persistent microaggressions here, right? Kind of, and they're kind of like three patterns that we see students feel underserved, underchallenged, and underwelcome, right? And so we have to be intentional in addressing how that is and how that plays out and why that is. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about the context of human resources where we have to think about you know, how is racism um, embedded in all these important processes and practices and the things, the process that we use to hire people and to socialize them and to uh, onboard them into our institution and to evaluate them. Uh, almost done, but we need to think about student conduct as a way or, 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 or do we find that there's disproportionate impact from minoritized students in our student conduct policies? Are there certain sources of uh, certain groups of students that are being over referred or over punished or over sanctioned for similar, um, you know, similar violations of campus policies? Um, how do we uh, create a, a comprehensive strategy for addressing racism? These statements of solidarity, they're nice, they feel good, but again, most of them are devoid of concrete actions and next steps. Uh, and so some things that, you know, we, that we need to do in terms of moving closer to concrete actions is thinking about how we can use our institution's strategic plan, because ultimately the strategic plan is what's going to guide what an institution will invest in, right? It's a real statement of values and priorities. And so if, if, if addressing racism is a priority, then we need to see some evidence of it in our strategic plan. We need to have measurable goals and we need to have resources that are allocated specifically for that purpose. Our mission statement tends to be symbolic, right? But in many ways, they reflect the institutional values. And so there should be some commitment to addressing equity, some commitment to addressing racism in the mission statement. And then, you know, we have to think about how do we engage our governing board? I know in a district, you know, the, the, the largest community college district in the country that, you know, the governing board can kind of be removed from what's happening at Mission College. Um, but I think they need to be a part of the conversation. They need to know what's going on. Uh, there, needs to, there needs to be some accountability there. And we also have to think about it. Um, our governing board uh, is comprised of elected officials that are accountable to the community. And so they have to understand that the community expects them to be abreast and address these issues. And so there's a responsibility and should be, should be some accountability there. Um, this is the last point, and then uh, I'd be happy to, to engage in some dialogue. But one of the most persistent and transparent indicators of racism is when we have minoritized students who don't achieve the same outcomes as their white peers. Um, this is the case at far too many places, far too many institutions, 
So we got to think about how do we disaggregate student success data on a routine basis and not just doing it at the institutional level, that's important, but think about how do we do it at the departmental level and even down to the program level to identify where are disproportionately impacted students um, experience an equity gap, right? So, and I'll say this, I do a lot of work across the country and no one does this better than the California community colleges. Um, because there's a transparent commitment to equity, there's equity plans, there's dedicated funding to do this. Thankfully, I know the governor proposed a, um, a huge cut to student equity and I'm glad that that, that was reconsidered um, because it's one of the most important tools that we have to really transform institutions and to institutionalize equity. And so I, you know, I think we need to continue to advocate uh, for these monies and for these funds. Uh, our colleague who I've re referenced before, Estella ben Simone, developed a framework called the Equity Scorecard that gives institutions some guidance on how they can use data to inform their effort, excuse me, particularly in the areas of access, retention, campus effort, and excellence. And so I would, I would take a look at her work, and there's a reference here. Um, you know, for some guidance there. And it's important to not just take a look at these data, but to engage in critical dialogue and sense making with colleagues about them and about what they mean. And so with that, I'm gonna leave, um, you know, sort of in my portion of the, uh, the prepared portion of this conversation with this, is that we can't look to our statewide leaders. Uh, all they really can give us are, are policies and strategies. Right, but they can't transform our institutional cultures. Ultimately, we're responsible for that as educators, um, as educators at the institution. Right, we got to do what we, we we can do to to create cultures that are conducive to doing equity and institutionalizing equity in a meaningful way. And we know that strategies alone don't get us there. We have to pay close attention to culture, and we really have to pay attention to it um, during the early rollout phases of any kind of effort. But that's when we really got to pay attention to it. And I often have colleagues that say, hey, Frank, is there an inventory? Is there a survey? Is there someone that we can bring in that can help us assess our culture? And I say, of course, there's a lot of people that, that you can reach out that can help you do that. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money to do campus climate and campus culture assessments. Although I know climate and culture are, are not the same, they're related, but they're not, they're different constructs. But I say, you know, culture is most obvious are most visible so where you really want to get a sense of where we are culturally you know sit in on a, a curriculum committee meeting you know sitting on a, on a budget committee meeting right sitting on on a, a hiring committees that's where we really get a sense of the culture and the conversations that guide our thinking and guide our actions as it relates to equity we also know that you know equity cultures most most colleges they're not, they're not good when it comes to engaging racial equity because most of us haven't been uh, you know, given the tools and the resources that we need to develop our capacity to even lead these conversations and do it. So we have a lot of work that, that's done there. And I know that this college is a part of the, the Equity Alliance that uh, Dr. Sean Harper is leading. And I think that's an important resource towards this end. And the last part is you know, we, we think about toxic support and toxic resistance. And toxic support is the oblivious, right? Toxic resistance are our passive resistors, and in some cases are defiant. And we tend to, um, we tend to overlook the, the devastating impact that toxic support has on our equity efforts. And we need to recognize that toxic support is just as bad, and in some cases worse, than toxic resistance. And so we need to be mindful of that. Um, so that, I thank you. Um, I, I am humbled and honored to have been able to be a part of this important conversation. Um, I salute the college for being willing to have this conversation. And uh, I look forward to, to any uh, dialogue and feedback that we'll have for the rest of our time together. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, I'm just going to mention a couple questions that were brought up in the chat. Ian uh, wanted to know, what should we do with the resistors that aren't passive? Oh, the active resistors. Well, so I think the goal is, so here's where you start. You start with your allies, right? Because the goal is to get to critical mass. You're never going to have 100% buy-in, right? You're never going to have 100% buy-in, but you want to get to the point where, you know, by and large, we have critical mass, where the folks who work here 
they value equity, they understand why it's important. And this is just not a comfortable place to be an active resistor. You know, that's, that's, and so you start with your, your ally. And, and, and then you, you sort of work your way to, to your passive resistors, right? And the idea is to get, there has to be some reason why you get resistors to care. Because far too often resistors resist because they don't feel like they're, they're an important voice in this conversation. They don't feel like they have something to contribute to this conversation, right? So these are the folks who are saying, you know, who've been at the college a long time, maybe since it was founded, right? I know Mission is a fairly young college, so, you know, you may have some faculty who've been there from the, from the origins of the institution that say, you know, the students that we have today are different than the ones we used to have. You know, they're not as serious as they used to be, right? They're not as committed as they used to be. And so it's kind of helping that person understand that, yeah, the students who we have are different. They're no less deserving. They're no less capable. They've changed, but we need to change also. We need to change in how we go about our work as educators. We can't do what we used to do 20 years ago because we're, it's a different world. It's a different context. Students have different needs. And so we have to grow and mature and who we are as educators, we have to continue to build our capacity as educators so we can be successful in meeting students where they are, right? We're an open access college. We're not, you know, we're not this exclusive, we're not Harvard, where, you know, we get to hand pick and cherry pick our students. We, um, you know, we, we take any student that can benefit from being here. And we're proud of that. That makes us a great institution. And so we have to care because it's, these are our people, these are our students who we have the honor and privilege of serving. And if we don't do it, then folks are not gonna just talk about, be talking about defund the police, they're gonna be talking about defunding us as education, as a system of education. And so we gotta, you know, we, we gotta make the connection to why they need to care and why it's important. Thank you. Um, Larry was asking, is there a way, um, we can assess, identify where we are in the taxonomy of the perspectives as an institution. Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I often say with this is, is sort of thinking about your own departments, thinking about where you spend most of your time and, and really, you know, reflecting on where you are, right? Are we equity enriched in, in our department? Do we, do we have a lot of resistance here? Do we really have equity? Is it a real value? Do we really embrace it with a sense of urgency? Right, and I think if everyone does that and everyone starts to assume some locus of control for the area that they have primary responsibility for. So, you know, if you're an adjunct faculty member, you may not have a lot of control over what happens, you know, at the larger departmental level but you have a lot of control of what happens in your classroom, right? That's your space, right? That's your domain. And you focus on making that space the best, the most equity-minded, equity-affirming place and space it can be, even if you feel like you're the only one doing it. And so if everyone commits to doing that, and, and we bring that same mindset to not just our classrooms, but if I'm on the academic senate, right? I bring that same mindset to the senate. If I'm a student leader and I'm a part of Associated Students, I bring that same mindset to AES. If I'm on a hiring committee, right, I bring that same mindset to this hiring committee. If I have some responsibility for curriculum, right, that's when we start to create an institutional culture where equity is visible and equity is valued and where we feel it. But we also need some help sometimes, right? We, we need to have you know, we need to be able to leverage our mission statement. We need to be able to leverage our strategic plan. We need to be able to leverage these important in institutional, uh, you know, documents and frameworks in order to be able to, to um, you know, help move things forward in a positive direction also. But it's, it's not easy. It's, you know, this is, yeah, it's easy for me to kind of talk for an hour and say, this is all the stuff you got to do. But, you know, this is, we're talking about, you know, in some cases, several years of intentional work uh, by a lot of people to, to really get to where we need to be. Bless you, Marina. Thanks.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge some of the comments that are in the chats, which are not questions for you. So we will pass those on to uh, our uh, leadership here, the, the questions about hiring practices and uh, funding for uh, Chicano Studies Department. So yeah. I'm going to try to focus the questions that are meant for you. And, uh, and I don't want them to think I'm, I'm ignoring it. We, we will definitely take those and uh, address them. Uh, when possible. Uh, Angela um, wanted to know if you could uh, address the difference between diversity, inclusion, and equity. Oh, I um, love this question. The nuance is important enough for us to acknowledge. Yeah, I love this question because we, we, we get this wrong all the time. Um, we, we treat those as synonymous concepts, as interchangeable concepts. What diversity is about is about, you know, do we have representation of you know a range of identities and perspectives right it's about who's there now when it comes to students i want to be very careful when i say this very careful when it comes to students in our particularly in our community colleges we don't really have a diversity problem right our institutions are incredibly diverse in a lot of different ways but but where we have challenges are when it relates to equity because, because equity is ultimately about outcomes. So you can't have a conversation about equity if you're not focused on outcomes, right? So when you have disparities, when you have certain groups, you know, we're, 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 we're 50 percent Latinx, but, you know, only 25 percent of, of our, our, our transfer students are Latinx, right? That's an that's a equity problem. That's a disparity. That's an issue, a question of outcomes. And then inclusion is about, okay, even if I'm here, do I feel safe? Do I feel welcome? Do I feel like my perspective is valued? Do I feel like I have a voice here? Or do I feel invisible? Or do I feel like I, I, I can be here, but I have to be quiet and really sort of shrink myself and not, you know, not let my presence be known and felt? Now, those are three different constructs. But we often think about them and talk about them as if they all mean the same thing, but they don't. Some people say equity and they're talking about diversity. Or they're saying diversity and they mean inclusion. And so if we're going to have productive conversations about this, then we got to be clear about, you know, we got to be able to, you know, define our terms and concepts and know, know the difference between all these, those three things. Right, because we got to be speaking the same language too, and we we often are, are are not. The other one is equality, right? A lot of folks, you know, they say, okay, well, let's talk about equity. Well, you know, why are we giving this group more than this group? Well, the whole definition, the whole concept of equity, is about closing equity gaps. It's about addressing disproportionate impact. You don't close equity gaps by giving everybody the same thing. And what we often see is, see there's a lot of places where even as success rates on certain indicators improve for racially minoritized students, the gaps don't close. And that's, right, that, that's when we approach our equity work through the lens of equality, which doesn't get us where we need to be. I love, I love this question. I really appreciate this question. Because you know we 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 aren't as intentional about being you know being clear and recognizing the difference between and I added a fourth equality as a fourth construct, but it's important. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark um, said when talking with resistors about the value of addressing the inequality, uh, the issue of data comes up. Yeah. Uh, are you the compelling resources that you would recommend um, that would address the value of equity yeah this is this is interesting um, and it's an important question so I appreciate it so data is an important tool in our conversations about equity because equity is about outcomes and you can't assess outcomes without data right you can't do that but what I find is that colleges usually have more data than they know what to do with so the access to data is not the problem although we could argue that do we have access to the right data when we need it? I think that's a separate conversation. 
sometimes we have the data, but we don't have the tools to facilitate critical conversations about the data. So where I've seen this work well is when we have good folks in IR who can not only provide the data, but can provide the context and the framing and help us kind of understand what this is and what it means, right? And that, you know, we have, we have, that, that's a different skill, um, but that's an important skill. And the reason why I chuckled when I heard the question, because I've also seen instances where what resistors do and they get real good and real creative is to stop anything from moving forward. They just keep asking for data, more data, more data, more data, more data. Right. And that's, that's, a, um, you know, it's kind of like when, when they, in Congress, when they call it filibustering. Right. And so I think that a similar thing happens with data. So I think as equity champions, we have to kind of recognize that when that's happening and we have to be able to say, okay, yeah, we can always ask for more data and data usually, uh, you know, raises more questions for more data, but let's like, let's, let's make sense of what we have here right now. And let's start to make some intentional decisions using the data that we have before asking for more, right? There's always going to be more questions, right? There's always going to be, you know, sometimes the quantitative data doesn't give you the perspective that the qual data gives you and vice versa. So, you know, I would also encourage us to, to not just look at the kind of traditional data sources, but also to use qualitative insights, ask your students, do focus groups, ask your students, to be, uh, you know, give them the opportunity to kind of share what they're experiencing. It's incredibly valuable data that could, could really move things forward in a, an intentional way. But yeah, I think it's data has to be a part of it, but don't allow it to derail you, right? Don't, don't allow it to stop the effort from moving forward because I've seen that happen also. Thank you. So we have two questions here, both about hiring practices. So Diana, a faculty member, wants to know if you could briefly share your thoughts on how to uh, more effectively update our hiring practices. And Jenny is a student, and she says, how can we as students help guide our faculty leaders to hire more of a diverse teaching staff, including more women in campus? Yeah, let me start with the second question. Um, so I think... We got to have stu students, there should never be a hiring committee where students are not represented. It should, that should never happen. Whether it's a faculty or an executive, like, so students have to be uh, the student voice. If we say we value it and we say that, you know, this is a college for the students, then they got to be involved in, in this. Now, I know sometimes that's difficult because, you know, it, it, search committees are incredibly time consuming. They take a lot of time. And, you know, our students don't often have a lot of time. And sometimes what happens is we end up just grabbing the students who are convenient, the students who are there. But we got to find ways to be more intentional about in, in, in involving more students. We should never have a hiring committee without students, student voices. And when we do it right, they, they, they bring incredibly value. We make better decisions, better hiring decisions when students are part of the conversation. Right. So that's, let, let me start by saying there. Stand in. in terms of the, the other question about how do we align our hiring practices to be more equity minded, first it starts with the position description, right? Are you, do you have a position description that actually talks about, you know, we are, you know, we're hiring a new mass faculty member, right? And not only do we want somebody that's, that, 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 that has the, 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 meets the minimum qualifications for math, but we also want somebody who has a proven track record of success in teaching math and not just teaching it, but helping students, diverse students from, a back, from diverse backgrounds be successful in math. Like we gotta be real intentional from the outset about who we're looking for here, right? We're looking for an equity champion with this hire. And then when we get them on campus, we gotta ask questions that ask them to provide concrete evidence of how they have done that. Like, don't just tell me what you would do or what you thought about doing. No, no, no. Give, give me concrete examples of how you have designed a lesson or designed a class in order to meet the needs of diverse or disproportionately impacted students, right? At LA Mission College, we're a proud HSI, right? Three-fourths of our students attend part-time and have families and work, right? And we think it makes us a wonderful institution. 
how are you going to teach math and give us examples of what you've done to facilitate success for those students, right? And then when they, they do the teaching demonstration, right, provide more evidence. And so it, equity has to be infused in every part of the process. You know? And traditionally, that hasn't been the case. Maybe there's one equity question, but we don't, you know, once that person, and it's not even an equity question, it's really a diversity question, which is not the same as an equity question, right? And so we got to be better at asking the right questions and making and asking folks to provide concrete evidence and then doing a better job of making sure that we're recruiting, that we're getting a diverse pool of applicants, right? That we're not just, you know, fishing in, in, in the same pond, right? And I think the adjunct pool is, 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 is a key part of that as well, because that's, it's almost like a back door, right? If, if you can get on as an adjunct and you can kind of, you know, you get immersed in the culture and people like you and, you know, a full-time position becomes available, well, guess who gets it, right? And so we need to be more thoughtful about who we bring on as, I'm not saying don't hire adjuncts, but even be intentional about hiring diverse colleagues that you bring on as adjuncts as well, right? That's, that's, that has to be a part of it also. Okay, um, so Diane has a question as a math teacher is close to my heart. It says, how do you address and combat the notion that equitize, uh, equitizing curriculum is diluting rigor? Yeah, and, I, I, and, and by the way, I use math as an, I wasn't picking on math. I, I will say, um, you know, I've worked at some campuses where the math faculty have been the biggest equity champions, right? So it's not about your discipline, it's really about your mindset. Um, but there is, there, there tends to be, a critical mass of colleagues who, who do believe that. And, you know, I think, I, I think we need to provide good examples and good, so like there's, there's a colleague, uh, Dr. James Gray, who's done a lot of work with the Center for Urban Education, who's like a math, who's like a math guru and who's all about equity and math. So, you know, exposing them to colleagues like that uh, and exposing them to different perspectives about, look, you can do math, you can teach math with a focus on equity and still have rigor and our students are still going to transfer to CSUN or UCLA. Like, it's not going to make us a, a less effective math department. We just got to change how we do it, right? It might mean that we need, to, we need to do a better job of providing supplemental resources, right? We need to, you know, maybe rethink our curriculum and how fast we're moving through. Um, but, yeah, so it's, it's about exposure because so often we think that the way that we learned it is the, way that, the only way to teach it and the only way to do it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to achieve our, our, our uh, to facilitate learning, whether it be in math or, or any discipline that we're responsible for. I think we have maybe time for one more. Uh, we're almost out of time. Um, Rie wants to know if you have any specific recommendations to support equity and inclusion in the classroom for instructors and students. Yes, yeah, so, um, so we, we at SIL, we've done a lot of work in this effort around, um, you know, so I know one, one book that was referenced in, our, in the intro was Teaching Men of Color uh, in Community Colleges. Now, I know some folks will say, oh, it's about men of color. Actually, you're going to find that a lot of what we talk about in that book applies, you know, to students, regardless of their identities. At the time we wrote that, we were focused on men of color because they tended to be the most disproportionately impacted group on most of our campuses. So I would, I would recommend that as a starting point for sure. Um, and then I, I would say I, um, our colleagues in the, uh, the RP group, I think is doing some, some, some good work that's focused on infusing equity in the classroom. Um, I, I think those are probably two resources that I would start with. And um, you know, bomb, bomb that I could even get you a link to, to both of those to share with the group. And I'll also be willing to share the slides as well. So um, I could, you know, create that and everybody who, who's registered could have the slides of a resource, you know, either you can share with your colleagues or to be some good bedtime reading when you're suffering from insomnia or whatnot. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, and I, again, I, I don't know uh, if, um, I think that's, all the questions I have, I know some faculty wanted to have a verbal question, but I think we just had decided we're going to uh, have it be in a chat session. Uh, so appreciate if you could share the slides. Uh, there have been a number of requests Absolutely. for them in, in the chat. Be happy and to. We, 
we, uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, as, as a campus. Uh, I think we have a lot of honest conversations we need to have and uh, look at a lot of our practices. But I would really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. And, and just know that you have a friend and a partner and a colleague in this work. So, you know, if I can be helpful and helping them move it forward, you know how to find me and um, I'll be there to support you. So thank you. Okay. So much, Dr. Harris. All right. uh, thank you. you. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, President. Right. I don't know if President Perez is still on, but uh, if he is, thank you for providing this, this space again. Um, not every, every leader and every president is, is willing to do this. So I, I thank you and I salute you. We'll let him know. Thank you yes. so much. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you for all the people who attended, students, faculty, yes. staff, everyone. Thank, thank you, you for coming.